Welcome to Dear Diaspora, a podcast celebrating the African diaspora and the change makers, innovators, and entrepreneurs working to make our world a better one to live in. I'm your host, Ndula Koa. Let's get started. So before I introduce the next guest, don't forget to leave a review, subscribe, and rate on Apple Podcasts. It makes a huge difference and One key way that it does that is people are more likely to check out an episode or two if they see that there are ratings and if they see that people are actually listening to the content and enjoying the content. And uh, one way to show that you enjoy the content is by leaving a review. So for everyone that's left a review, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if you are listening on any other podcast listening platform, please make sure you follow the podcast so you're notified each Sunday when new episodes come out. And lastly, if you're listening on Spotify, you can actually share the podcast that you listen to on Instagram stories, just like you would a song. So if you're listening to Dear Diaspora on Spotify, you can share that in your Insta stories and I will repost. Um, So of course, tag Dear Diaspora and I will repost and really appreciate you spreading the word about the podcast. So my next guest is Victor Noadike, a 21-year-old entrepreneur, and he is the founder of Canigo. So Canigo is a company providing a standard, transparent, and safe way for consumers to receive their medical or recreational cannabis products by way of on-demand delivery. So my conversation with Victor was just super interesting. He taught himself how to code and develop apps by 15. By the time he was 17, he developed and launched three applications that were ranking on Apple's iTunes App Store. And he walks us through his journey, going to school, teaching himself how to code and develop websites, and then starting this cannabis technology company. And you'll just love um, hearing from him and you know how his parents reacted to him, sharing that he is starting a cannabis tech company. And uh, we also get into what he'd like to do um, after Canigo and, you know, some of his dreams of working in Nigeria, where he's from. So tune in. I really love this conversation and I hope you enjoy it as well. Victor, thank you so much for being a guest on Dear Diaspora. I'm so excited to have you. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Yes, um, I was so happy to meet you a couple of weeks ago. Um, here in Kansas City and thought it'd be great to just learn more about you and you know the company that you are starting Um, so I always start by asking guests like where you're from uh, where did you grow up and um, just what's your experience been like um, just growing up in the US oh yeah sure so I was originally born in Nigeria um, full-blown Americanized at this point. I moved to the States when I was four years old. I grew up in Miami. I lived there for like 10, 12 years. And then I lived in Tennessee for, I think, about maybe four or five years, I believe. I know it was like freshman year of high school till college. So whatever that length is. Um, and then I moved to Atlanta uh, for uh, college. I went to Morehouse College. And um, now I, I reside in Boston because I actually work at a, uh, at a medical startup. I actually moved to Boston like a week and a half ago, so I'm brand new, you know, to, to the north. But uh, yeah, um, I really never, I really never know how to say like where I'm from because I, I've I've been living in different areas sectionally. Uh, people kind of say like. Oh, well, it depends on where you're born. So I say like Nigeria or it depends on where you spent the longest time. So I say Miami. So it's a very like multi-faceted answer. So I just kind of like like explaining it like that a bit better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. And growing up in Miami, were there a lot of people that had um, like were from Nigeria or had like similar backgrounds as you? I- I will definitely say that um, my most of my life, my dad's Nigerian, my mom's Jamaican. I would definitely say, and I think my sister would, would back me up. We definitely experienced the more Nigerian side of of, of that relationship. Um, you know, my dad was really, really big into the Nigerian community. I never really kind of grabbed into it. 
uh, mainly because maybe, you know, I just didn't grow up there. But, you know, I remember definitely having like, you know, jello fries, you know, goosey, you know, there's all these types of traditional foods, doing all these types of tr- traditional things. And we had masquerades. And, uh, we went to Nigeria a couple of times when I was younger. So I do kind of like remember some parts about it. So, um, but in terms of like, um, in terms of that, yeah, there's there's a massive like Nigerian culture in Miami. I know it's like there's some hot centers. So there's like uh, the DMV, uh, which is like Washington, Maryland, um, and Virginia. Mm-hmm. Atlanta is another hodgepodge. Miami is one center. Houston's another. And I think some area in like California, like maybe like Southern California, like Los Angeles, is like a really really big area where like Nigerians kind of congregate. So yeah. <laughs> Nice. I feel like Nigerians are just everywhere. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, let's get more into like coding and you mm-hmm. know teaching yourself to be a developer. Like, I saw that you were like a self-taught um, coder by the age of fifteen. Yeah. Um, could you share more about that? Like, how did you go about teaching yourself how to code? Sure. Um, actually, my whole life, a lot of people don't know this, but K through 12 was homeschooled. Um, I was homeschooled oh, wow. my whole life. Um, college was was uh, the first kind of, I guess, traditional, quote unquote, structured type of education that 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 I had. Not to say homeschooling wasn't structured, but uh, when you kind of think in, when you think of school in that kind of sense, that that's really where my exposure level started. Um, people were like, well, you know, I never would guess because you're social. And I'm like, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, the moniker is true because there are kind of some anti-social people who really don't speak. But my mom made made it an effort to kind of involve me in terms of a lot of stuff. But to kind of get back off the topic, um, I kind of give that background because when I moved my freshman year of, um, of high school um, from Miami, I lived in East Tennessee, uh, like Sevierville, Gatlinburg, you know, area. It's really, really cabin It's definitely nothing like Miami. And so I remember I told my mom, I was like, hey, mom, like, I'm really bored. I have no friends. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> I, have to, I have to do something with my life. I'm really like, I just need to do something because doing school and unpacking and just watching TV just isn't it, chief. And she, uh, she basically was like, you know, you like games. Why don't you figure out how to code? And I was like, how the hell do you do that? <laughs> and, you know, it was really interesting because that that question that my mom proposed was really what got me into it. I never really thought about making video. I liked playing. Like, I played a lot of Call of Duty and stuff. I played a lot of, like, PlayStation growing up. But I never really thought about ever making something. And so when my mom told me that, I was like, well, I have nothing but time uh, to, to do. So I spent... The first, I remember spending like the first one to three days looking up what fits me and what I really understand because I definitely saw like Python and different coding stuff and it was way too aggressive for me. Like I just couldn't understand it as a 15 year old kid. And um, I know there are other people who like taught themselves how to like code like serious like development by like 12 and 13, but um, I do, like I started off, I started with this authoring tool called Game Salad and what Game Salad was, it allowed you to code, but it didn't give you the complexity of coding. So it kind of made it something, the the intent for the program was like for someone who's like 13 years old, who's interested in coding, who would want to make like actual games, like 2D games, like some simplistic, actually you can get very complex um, games. And um, I, I picked it up. It was free at the time. I think you have to pay for it now. But it was free, and I was just thinking of ideas. So I sat down one day, and I just think I really liked the idea that you can think of something, and you can see that idea that you had in your head slowly manifest you know, on the screen, and you can interact with that idea. And it's not really more of an imagination, but then it becomes more tangible. You know, and so I think I kind of got hooked on the idea that I can sit down and say, hey, like, I'm thinking about a game that ball, like a ball bounces up and down the screen. And if you sit down for a couple minutes or a couple hours or a day or two, that same idea you had in your head, you can actually play with. And so that really got stuck in my head. And I just never really stopped until like I was 17, 17, 18. Wow. Yeah, that's so cool. 
And mm. I saw that you you launched three apps by yeah. the age of 17. So yeah. like what happens after you launch an app? Like is it do they are they still out there? Like do they still exist? Um did people did someone like buy them from you? Like how mm. does all that work? Um you're not the first person to ask is when people say like oh like you code like what are your apps and yada yada yada. Currently I don't have any apps available but when I was like kind of like from the f- from 15 to 17, I remember I was in Florida and I was with my cousin when I launched my first application. I don't know how long I was coding, but it must have been a couple months because these were definitely stolen like sprites that I found online. Like sprites are just images. So I definitely <laughs> found uh, some royalty free images and I just like uh, plastered it and just kind of made the functionalities behind them. And it was this, it was the first game I made, it was called Boom Jump. And um, essentially, it was it was a spinoff off of Doodle Jump. And so I don't know if you ever played Doodle Jump, but you have this character and you tilt your phone left and right and you bounce on these ledges and you just kind of keep increasing. It's, a, it's an endless game. You play it forever until you die. That's kind of like how you lose the game. And so I was really inspired by that. And that was something that I was able to kind of figure out how to do. And so I remember um, my uncle... Um, he bought my first year of developer account because you have to pay like $100 to get a developer account with Apple. And so I never really knew that it was done, but I knew that I really just wanted to have an, out, have an app out there. And so I remember when I posted and my cousin was with me and he was playing some of it and we were just kind of out. I remember I was literally up all night trying to figure out how to work this thing out. And I got approved. And I remember I went to bed one night, and the next morning I woke up, I had like 30 downloads. Um, I couldn't tell you where I got those downloads from, I'm going to be honest with you, zero clue. But (laughs) I do know that that the fact that somebody downloaded the app was just kind of like, wow, like somebody was interested enough to actually get it on their phone. And so from there, I just really sat down and just started thinking of more and more ideas and my games got more and more complex as they went ahead because it was really encouraging to see all that time and work a couple months like maybe three to six months of my life really didn't go in vain because at least 30 people cared enough to download it so yeah wow that is super super cool and so walk us through how you go from like you know, the game apps and things like that to starting Canago, which is like a full on like company. Like, yeah, yeah. Walk us through like that journey a little bit. That is a journey. That is a, that is a journey. Um, so after that, um, I, I knew that I wanted to be in the technology sector. Um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do coding, you know, coding these games uh, by 17 was really the first um, submersion that I really had. And so when I got accepted to Morehouse and, um, I decided to, um, leave that part of my life behind because I just didn't want to be known as as someone who, who only knows how to make games. I just didn't want to kind of concatenate myself into, into one box. And so, um, I went to Morehouse for a bit. Um, I got my I got my first internship my sophomore year of college. I actually was I actually didn't get a single offer my freshman year and that was full blown narcissism from my end because I came to school and I came to school, I had like three different apps. I was on the news in Tennessee. I thought that I, I made it essentially and um I remember I, I had an an interview with Airbnb and I knew at that moment that I was not who I thought I was. Like that was the most humbling moment ever because I remember I went into that interview. I really didn't practice as much as I should have. I was like, ah, I'm, I should be good enough, you know, like, you know, who's going to reject me? And I went in there and she asked me like a really, really basic coding instruction. And I remember I was just panicking. I didn't know what I was doing. And she sent me that fat rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, after that point on, I, I, um, I spent that summer teaching myself how to develop websites. So I, I learned like HTML, CSS. Um, I'm more of a front end developer, so I, I really never understood like how back. I understand how back end works, but coding it was a completely different beast. 
And so I, I spent the summer teaching myself how to develop websites. And one of the first websites that I made was an it was a clone of the BBC website. I bought a Udemy course. It was like ten or fifteen, ten, fifteen, twenty dollars. And I spent the whole summer just kind of like learning that. And so based off of the mistakes that I made my first summer, um, I, I ended up uh, and I ended up getting like four or five different internship offers my next summer. Wow. And so, you know, I and I got some from like NBC, Home Depot. I think I got one. I remember a guy from Sonic, like a fast food joint, was really, really interested in getting me on there. And I ended up um, interning with this company called the Climate Corporation. And I remember my mom was really annoyed. She was like, why would you want, like, why would you not, you know, why do you want to go with this unknown company when Home Depot and NBC, you know, are giving you offers? And I was like, well... You know, um, the the CTO of the company came to Morehouse and I told him a story similar to mine about how I developed all these apps. And, you know, I guess he saw the drive and ambition within me. And he essentially offered me a spot to come work for him for the summer right there and then. And he told me and, and you know, when when a CTO of, of, a, of a well-funded startup offers you and says, hey, you know, come work for me for the summer, you don't say no. You know what I mean? You just mm. you just do it. And I guess that's kind of similar to how I am. I'm very optimistic. I guess that's how I'm in Boston now. But, um, you know, when someone like that gives you an offer, you just take it. You know, um, I'm pretty sure I would have done well at NBC or something, but I know for a fact I would have not been working for, like, an executive, you know. And so just being out in, in, uh, in California, being able to kind of create that relationship with my boss, being able to kind of see how startups are ran. And I knew that I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And um, really, that moment was really pivotal because the main reason why I decided to start my start my own, start my uh, my company, and I knew I was able to kind of do this, was um, there was this, there was this, there's this event in the Bay Area that they hold every every summer. It's called Interim Palooza, and um, essentially it's it's imagine like your school career fair but like on steroids <laughs> who comes out there everyone comes out there everyone's just recruiting and they have a lot of these like esteemed really really successful individuals come out and there was this guy his name was Corey levy and um he had this company that he it was a yc company so a uh y combinator company and um he basically was just kind of, I think he was like 28 or 26, something like that, late 20s, early, mid mid to late 20s. And he essentially told his story of how he went to like University of Illinois, I believe. I think he went to a school in Chicago or, 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 or Illinois. And um, he went there for a year. He basically was like, screw that and started his own business. He got into YC and like he sold his company to Apple. And um, that was the path that I was really, really interested in. And so I took a lot of inspiration. I got his email. I kind of, at that point, Canago was just more of an idea rather than like a full-fledged full -fledged company. So I, I got his um, email. He told me to keep up with him. And I've been sending him emails um, to this day. And he responds. I don't think he responds to my last email. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I sent him about like at least 20 emails. And he's res been responding to most of them. So, But people like that are usually really busy or, you know, so... I don't really take anything like that to heart. So uh, I was really, really inspired by him and his story. And it really gave me the confirmation that, like, you know, I can do this. Like, I I don't need a degree to do this. Like, just kind of seeing someone and meeting someone and touching someone who's done what you wanted to do kind of puts a lot of things into, into perspective for you. And so from that point on, I... You know, I, I messaged um, Kevin Math, my co-founders, and I was like, hey, guys, like, we're doing this. Like, I'm, you know, that week I created, like, a 30, 40-page business plan. I started really trying to figure out ways to, like, how do I start a company with, like, zero dollars? Like, how do I do that? And so from that point on, you know, we've just been kind of tweaking it, going at it consistently, persistently. And, um, you know, you, you just... You know, if you're persistent and you're passionate enough and you're willing to get growed and listen to really, really smart people and, this, and and accept the fact that you're not the smartest person in the room and there are people who are 10 times as smart as you and you take their critiques, um, you know, you eventually kind of end up in situations where you're like part of OHUB, KC, 
and you're sitting down talking to investors and you're really at the last stages of an idea and really maturing into a startup, into a proper startup. So, yeah. Wow. And I have a quick question for you because I know your background is more like techie. How did you put that business plan together? Like, how did you know, like, you know, what to put down for like financials, marketing, like all that stuff? Like, how did you Google it or how did you put that together? Um, it was a mixture of both. Um, so the my team is is pretty is pretty diverse within our skill sets. One thing that I I I do, and maybe it's because I'm an Eagle Scout or something like that. I have no idea, but. <laughs> But I do think that one thing that I learned was complementary skills, right? Um, know what you're good at, be honest with what you're good at, and find other people who are good at other parts that, you're, that you lack in, right? So I'm not the best, like, marketer, right? I can come up with marketing strategies. I can come up with different, like, you know, financial, financial plans and stuff. But in terms of, like, really executing and being passionate about it, um, that's not my strong suit. So... Um, Matthew, he was like, he's, uh, he goes to Morehouse and he's a, a finance major and he's really, really passionate about finances. Like, I mean, I'm, I can do marketing, but finances is just like a different beast. And he would sit down here and he created like a five year like plan, how much money we're going to make, our CACs, all that fun stuff. And so he really was like the backbone for our projections. And that really helped a lot in terms of like having conversations with investors because he sat down and made it palatable and kind of saying like, well, okay, well, if we need like for a cannon goal to get to this stage, we need this amount of money and this is exactly how much we're going to burn. You know what I mean? Like, so he helped a lot by bringing that expertise to the table. Kevin, he's technical. So I would say more for me, I'm more on the um, business strategy uh, product end. And that's really where my strong suits are. And that's what I'm passionate about. Um, Kevin enjoys like, you know, being like a product man, like a technical product manager. So he works on like the development side, the coding end, looking up all our back end and front end and kind of thinking about how like the core platform is built out. Um, Matthew loves, you know, the uh, marketing and coming up with financial projections. So it's really just kind of like figuring out, you know, finding, well, finding people who are serious uh, because it was interesting how I found them too, but finding out how, you know, the people who are serious and um, really seeing where their weaknesses are, seeing where your weaknesses are, and seeing what value you guys can, you know, equally bring to the table. So that's kind of like, yeah, how, how I kind of built out the business plan and as well as Google and YouTube, for sure. <laughs> Google <Yeah>. University. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And so Canago, um, would you, like I, I have the description of like what it is, mm -hmm. but do you want to kind of share um, you know, what Canago is exactly and how it's going to work for yeah. like users or people. So in like 2018, um, to kind of, I guess, show you how far back we've been thinking, because I did have another company that I tried to run for a bit, completely failed. I tried to re re rerun my, my dad's old engineering firm and I utterly failed at that. And I, I enjoyed the fact that I failed at that because it really kind of let, let me know what I'm good at and what I'm not. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say it was a failure financially completely it was, but I think like uh, growth wise it was. So I think that was really needed for me to kind of like lead Canago in a proper a proper area. So originally uh, the, the idea for Canago came out, we wanted to be originally in, in, in cannabis. So the idea was very simple. I remember um, me, Matthew, and other people at that time, we would meet up in Woody, like maybe Woody was the, was the central library for the AUC. So that's like Spelman, Morehouse, and Clark Atlanta University. And that's a central library that everyone uses. And we would meet up and we would kind of have a think tank and say, hey, like, you know, what are some ideas that, that we can do? And I remember saying like, hey, you know, why don't we make a cannabis delivery application? And we just kind of put it in the think tank. And we just were just, and one day I just kind of started take, taking it a bit more seriously. So February 2018 was really the idea of Canago. Originally, we wanted to be a cannabis uh, delivery uh, application, similar to the same business model and same product that we're providing now. The main reason why we're doing CBD is just for legality reasons and investor reasons. 
But um, in a nutshell, Canago is a is a standard transfer and safe way for consumers to receive their CBD by on demand uh, delivery. So you can think about it as like the Grubhub or the Uber Eats or the DoorDash for CBD products. Um, what we're doing is with our patented technology is that we're verifying the supply chain of uh, of CBD. So recent news, um, the vaping incidents about how those tampered um, cartridges came along. Um, those were those were um, cartridges that came from legitimate sources. However, there was tampering wherever the supply chain might have might have um, ended up. What our patent does is that we're able to take using blockchain technology, we're able to kind of like do a reverse cycle and say, okay, well, here's one tampered e-cigarette cartridge. Let's follow the chain back. Let's follow the chain of custody back and verify, hey, you know, where could this have been tampered? And we're able to kind of do that in an autonomous fashion and um, really be able to provide a, a safe way, a, a verified safe way for consumers to receive their, their products so they know that whatever they're ingesting is safe for them to consume. Very, very cool. And so I'm semi-familiar with blockchain technology. So how do you get each person in the supply chain to essentially they would have to like record or like, you know, so somehow keep track of each activity that they do right and like add it to this like shared um ledger like how does how does that work so kevin uh, that's actually kevin's department but i definitely will speak on him because he, he really liked this idea because we were brainstorming we were wondering what's the best way to do this so we wanted to do it in the most simplistic way and we wanted to uh, we're, we're definitely building out this technology we own the idea to it so it's not 100 percent like in full fledged that's kind of what we're raising the money for is to kind of build this idea into something more tangible um but how we envision this product to work right now, version 1.0 and Canago Trust, that's what we call it, um, is that we want, um, let's say, so when, when, you, when you think about the, uh, the life cycle for CBD, right? It's, it's the grower, then it goes to the wholesaler, and then it goes to the dispensary, then it goes to the, to the, um, to the consumer, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's, those are the, those are like the four main, main, main parts of so really what we want to do is that we wanted to implement a QR code scanner uh, where a label would be printed. And based off of that label, um, we wanted individuals to um, scan that scan that label. From that point on, it would kind of tell us, hey, who's who currently has the chain of custody? And at the end of the chain of custody, like let's say, for example, um, we, you, you get a, you get, let's say you're, you're, uh, uh, you have a CBD. Uh, dispensary right and so we go from seattle right where it's grown from that's just a place that i'm picking and then it gets shipped all the way to, to delaware and then from there it goes all the way to your to your store so from that point on in terms of our canago system based off of the qr code implementation in terms of just doing a quick scan because people in like ups they do that that's how they that's how they're able to say your package has been delivered or or um, your package is this far away, or your package has gotten here, it's by a quick scan. So we thought about this from a product design and a technology standpoint in terms of like how difficult would this be? And so since people are already scanning packages to kind of update that system to say, hey, this is where the chain of custody currently like lies for a package, we thought that we could use that same intuitive um, idea, but use it, but, but utilize your smartphone and use it on our core application to update that lineage. Ah, got it. Got it. Yeah. That's cool. And so from like a regular person that wants to, let's say, order their CBD oil, mm -hmm. they're, they're doing it just the way they would maybe using, um, some other competitor, mm -hmm. like, but then your like added, I guess, value is that you are verifying that it hasn't been tampered with in any way and that it's like a good quality product, right? What we're verifying is the chain of custody, right? So at the end of the day, when you, uh, the, the idea is when you go on our application, you see John Doe's CBD product, right? Um, 
based off that John Doe CBD product, you'll be able to tell who whose like chain of custody it was from and who who's uh, who touched it and when it was harvested. So you know if you're getting the freshest quality CBD oil, edible, topical, whatever it might be, and you'll be able to also say like, okay, this dispensary touched it, this wholesaler touched it, and it was sourced from this area. So that's what we're doing. We're 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 essentially making it more transparent. I don't want to sit down here and, and claim and say, hey, yeah, we're making CBD 100% safe. So, like, there'll be no issues because, I mean, if someone gets sick, <laughs> you know, um, that's an absolute massive litigation. But what right. we are doing is that we're showing that we're making it more transparent by showing the chain of custody and being able to, to present uh, where your product is being sourced from. That's what we're doing. Yes. Mm. So, you can make, uh, uh, so you as the end consumer can make more educated decisions and say, okay, well, hmm, this was harvested this day. Uh, I don't like it. Or this was touched by this person. Uh, I don't like it. You kind of get what I'm saying? Totally. Totally. Yeah. And just one more question. So sure. is the average CBD user educated enough to know that I don't want to buy something that was harvested two years ago or something like that? Like, do people have that sort of knowledge about CBD or... So we did do uh before before we went like you know deep deep dive into Canada we did run a close targeted survey, and in terms of their knowledge base you know I can't honestly tell you I think that's all relative in terms of like because someone might look at something and say oh like a week or you know three months is old I want something that was harvested two days ago I think that's all like very relative and opinionated depending on each person you ask because I can guarantee if someone like looks at like a bag of weed and was like hey you know. I <laughs> months ago they're gonna be like Ugh, that's old as hell like you know what i mean or <laughs> you kind of get what i'm saying yes so, but i what i can say and put some data behind that is based off of our closed survey uh, circuited date uh survey we asked a very particular question which kind of gave me a resounding yes like this is a great idea and we should protect this and actually build it out into a company we asked we asked those people who took a survey and who are consumers of cannabis and cannabis products we asked them and said, hey, you know, do you care about where your products are sourced from? Do you want to know that information? And 89% of them said yes. So um, mm -hmm. that is information. To, now, now our, 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 my job is to make sure that that information is being provided. Whatever the consumer wants to do with it and whatever the consumer, if the consumer decides to look at it or not or, or decides, you know, that's, that's their prerogative, that's their decision. We're giving them that option as an alternative. But really what we did know from that survey was that a resounding population of the people that we, that we surveyed actually cared about where their products were being sourced from and would like to know where the products are being sourced from. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally think this is a great idea because I feel like with any product these days, people want to know mm -hmm. who made it, you know, where is it coming from? Was it like sourced in like, you know, an ethical way? Like... Mm -hmm. People want to know more. Um, so I think you guys are onto something <laughs> for sure. Um, and so what did your parents think about you starting essentially like a CBD company? Like, are they like conservative or were they uh, super supportive? Like, what was their reaction when you first told them? Um, they weren't. They were. I think my parents are very old culture they're old they're very old timey my dad's nigerian my mom's jamaican so education is like the biggest thing for them now um and when i say education i mean degrees that's what that's what that's what, that's <laughs> what I mean. like the fact that you have a degree and you have multitudes of degrees it doesn't matter if you're the smartest person in the world to them if you don't have like a degree it's like well who are you you know but <laughs> but Right. So it was pretty overbearing to kind of say like, hey, you know, I'm leaving school and I'm also starting a weed company. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like, like, um, you know, to start selling weed, like for, for them, I do think that um, at the beginning, they were very, very much against it. Um, you know, they were against it. I'm not gonna say very much. It was blatant that, that, that they don't want me to do this. But I think that they've kind of got into an age where they are trying to be as supportive as they know how. And the fact that I told them that like, hey, you know, not only can I make money from this, but this is legal and I'm not gonna go to jail. I think that kind of <laughs> that kind of helped them a lot. 
Um, and I think they, um, when I started kind of like getting advisors and getting a founding team and they were able to really kind of see tangible evidence that this wasn't just me selling weed, it's quote unquote, because that's what a lot of people were just kind of, and I used to get really offended by that. I was like, what, what the hell? Like, I'm not selling weed. Like, you know what I mean? Like, why are you using such a, <laughs> why are you trying to like downplay what this is? You know, I can go sell weed. That's no problem. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're trying to do something here that's like revolutionary. And I don't want to say disruptive because I think that's like a, a, a yucky word that a lot of like Silicon Valley-ish people use. Like, oh, we're disruptive. But no. Very overused. Yeah. yeah <laughs> overused, you know. And so I really just didn't like how we were defined as an application that sells weed because we're doing a lot more than that. I w- I'd rather say, I'd rather have people saying, hey, you guys are selling safe weed. I'd rather be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be better at that. But um, just kind of the connotation that goes behind just someone selling weed was, I don't know, it was really disrespectful to me. But I do think my parents were really against it at first, and I really didn't get the initial support that I liked. But I do think once they kind of realized that I was really, really serious about this and, um, you know, I had promised and my, my dad actually started sending, sending me, we have a family group chat. And one day my dad just sent me an article about like the profitabilities of the cannabis company, I mean, can, the cannabis uh, sector and the CBD sector. And so my dad, once in a while, he sends me articles. So he went from being like, kind of like hesitant against it, you know, to send me articles kind of saying like, hey, you know, what are you guys doing? Like, you know what I mean? Like, hey, let's try let's try to hop on this train. Like, don't leave it. So um, it, it's kind of better now and it's easier that I can openly, because I, I ran this company, I ran this idea really for like eight, nine months, almost a year without them knowing. Because I was just afraid of what they were going to say. Were they just going to shut down the whole organization? Were they just going to go to Atlanta, pick me up, and like make sure that I never get back to Atlanta again? So I was kind of scared. But um, when I told them about it, you know, I was really far deep into it, and I was able to kind of show them like, hey, you know, we're talking to these people, and we have this traction, we have this. So um, they eventually came around. But I would say I was definitely living in, in a nice bit of fear for a good year from my parents. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I totally understand. Wow. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. And so, do you see Canago staying focused on like CBD and can other cannabis products, or like do you plan to take the transparency aspect? Like, do you do you see that like working in with other sort of products? Yeah, so we actually wanted to, I mean, this is, of course, once we kind of like, well, first, let's let's raise some cash. And then, <laughs> you know, but, but we have a five year plan for sure. And we have, uh, you know, the, the way that the way that we see the company going is very, very linear. Um, we think about applying the technology to like the food industry, to the pharmaceutical industry. You know, um, just because, you know, we can we can take this core idea of verifying the supply chain from from A to Z and, you know, really put anything else in there. We can put an apple in there and see, hey, where is this apple really coming from? What are the ethics behind this apple? Who's touching this apple? You know, and just kind of like create it from there. We could really try to apply this technology to definitely other industries. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that definitely would be in the in the thought book once we kind of establish ourselves more as a brand as a company and uh really kind of prove that our technology works because once we prove our technology works we can license it out to really any industry who who really wants to have that ability to automatically uh, verify their supply chain wow so so cool and so where do you do you see yourself um first have you been to nigeria as an adult Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you ever see yourself doing business in Nigeria, or is that just not really a, a thing you're thinking um, about? Well, well, um, to to be to be, yeah, no, I haven't. I said mm-hmm as kind of like uh, I heard you. No, I haven't been to Nigeria as an adult. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nigeria was like 2006, 2007, something around there. So it's been a while. I'm 21, so I must have been like, but it was that like eight, nine, okay. ten. Maybe even younger, I'll say like eight, nine. So, but I do remember it, um, some parts of it. Um, but I do think that after Canago, like post Canago, 
um, you know, let's say Canada goes really successful, we have an acquisition, or, you know, we just kind of keep it within the family, and we just kind of are keep generating revenue. I really want to take the VC uh, culture and really apply it to, you know, Nigeria. Because I remember I was, I, there was this video that I saw on Facebook, and this guy, he, our currency is Naira. He gave he gave her like a bunch of naira, and he basically bought out all the all the items that he was he was he was uh, she was selling the woman was selling, and she um, you know started crying. She started you know kind of saying thank you, you know, doing all these things. And you know the sad part about it is is that the black community gets exploited all the time, and you know we we get exploited for our creativity, we get exploited for our, our mineral rich, you know land that we have we get exploited for ourselves you know quote unquote slavery and you know one thing is is that i want to be able to go out there and build these businesses build a startup culture you know in africa build a hub build somewhere where you know it's normal for individuals for other black other you know other black individuals to invest in other companies in a vc matter you know i really really want to go out there and change that culture and you know of course this is you know, successful Victor speaking, you know, success based off of Canigo. But I definitely do know that um, when I'm done with Canigo or Canigo becomes more established as, 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 as a brand and as a company and is doing well, I'm going to really focus my, my, the money that I make off of it into investing into other, you know, Nigerian based, African based, majority black owned based, you know, uh, startup ideas, because I think that they're, you know, they're geniuses within within us, but we just don't have the support or resources to really bring that to the next level. Mm. Yeah. Wow, I love that. Yeah. yeah, that's super cool. And so how are you going about raising money for your startup? Like, are you, yeah, like, who are you talking to? Are you fundraising? Like, did you do some fundraising in Georgia? How did that go? Um, I'm really talking to anybody who will listen. Mm-hmm. Um, I, that's kind of like where it's at. Um, I think, I think one thing that we completely missed was the idea of actually getting money behind this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were so focused on creating traction. We were so focused on the product. We were so focused on growth. We were so focused on everything that we completely forgot that, hey, you know, at the end of the day, we're all college students. You know what I mean? Who have like no money and actually will need some funding behind this to, to really get this anywhere. Um, you know, bigger than bigger than these kind of conversations that we're having amongst ourselves, amongst three of us. So um, I, I'm, I'm I'm very opportunistic. Um, networking was my thing. Um, I ended up kind of like leaving school for a bit. Well, I left school and I knew school. I left school <laughs> <laughs> um, because I saw that that the secret sauce wasn't necessarily within the within the classrooms rather than it was the network that that you create and um school never really taught you that instead i was killing myself trying to learn french and <laughs> you know not really passing anything but um i realized that uh, you just never know who you're standing next to you know i've i've met people i've met like like one of our advisors is uh he's a chairman of of um, he sits on the on the council board, not the chairman. He sits on the council board for the city of Berkeley, and um, he was actually one of the first politicians to buy um, cannabis using blockchain. And you know, he's one of our advisors. And wow. so, kind of creating that VC investor network is just kind of like putting yourself there. You know, um, you know, if you're in areas that aren't really invested in stuff, I mean, like for Atlanta, for example, you know, go to go to North Atlanta. Go to Atlanta Tech Village. Go out there. You know, have conversations. Don't make the conversation about you and what you know what you need. Make the conversations about them and what they need. You know, be valuable because I'm going to be honest with you. No one, no one cares about you until you provide them value. You kind of get what I'm saying? Like mm. no, one, no one will care. I I can probably you can have the you can have Facebook 2.0 or Facebook on steroids, but you know if you don't know how to have a network and really try to have a conversation with the person because like you have to realize like when you're speaking to vcs vcs have made it you know vcs aren't worried about their lights vcs aren't worried about how they're going to pay off their student loans vcs have enough disposable income where they're willing to 
invest hundreds of thousands to millions, tens of millions, or even hundreds of millions, or even billions, depending on, you know, what VC you're talking to. So, you know, you coming to them with like a, a sad story of like, oh, I was broke and, you know, I was making, you know, I was eating ramen noodles and, you know, like, <laughs> be it, that's a very true story, but they don't care. You kind of get what I'm saying? And that's just the uh, God, uh, like honest truth. So, you know, you know, and the other thing too is, is speak to a VC that's in your field. Um, I think for me, it's like anytime I heard VC, I was like, oh crap, let me pitch Canago. Let me talk about Canago. But Canago at the at, at, at its core of an, an idea is is a is a is a cannabis, you know, C B D cannabis application. And I'm out here trying to pitch this idea to someone who's a real estate mogul. And not saying that they don't understand, you know, you know, business is business fundamentally, but that's not their industry and they won't know it better than someone who's a cannabis VC. So I think um, you know, I've been trying to figure out more VCs who are within my region. But the other thing too is just really putting yourself out there networking, go out there and get grilled. You know what I mean? Like Matthew, Matthew and I can tell you the time we went to Atlanta Tech Village and I'm pretty sure you can find it. We got chewed alive. It was terrible. You know, um, we thought we knew enough. But, you know, it's moments like that when you get actual investors grilling you, talking about like, hey, why are you doing this? You don't even have an answer for this, is 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 really, really humbling because you realize that, okay, you don't know it all. And you want to get to a point where you can't get grilled anymore, where you're literally looking for people to grill you, where you're looking for people to like try to disprove you and they can't because you have all the facts behind you. So, you know, taking on, I mean, you need that rejection. I mean, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be successful, if you want to be a standout individual, you have to be willing to take constructive criticism and not take it personal. And you have to be willing to take it from people that you look up to. You have to be taking like, hey, like, you know, if you know someone who's a VC, who's your friend, be like, hey, like, look at this and tear me apart. I want you to tear me apart because if you can't tear me apart and you're a VC, that means I've answered every single question that you can ever ask and I've proven everything. You kind of get what I'm saying? So yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. And so how, like if someone's listening to this episode, um, how can people like support you or um, like, is it downloading the app or getting on like an email list or like how can people help you? Yeah, for sure. Um, you, uh, Our main hub of like kind of Canago communication right now is our Instagram. So we're at like Canago app. So C-A-N-N-A-P-P. Oh, wait, it's Canago C-A-N-N-A-G-O-A-P-P. Um, that's our uh, that's our tag, uh, Canago app. Um, from there, our website's in there. So we're like at tricanagoapp.com. We're also at canago.com, canagoapp.com. Um, but the main way to kind of get in direct contact with me would be going through our Instagram at Canago app, um, probably DMing me, uh, or DMing, DMing the Instagram or the, the main account follows me. So I'm at HTTP underscore Victor. So if you look at who the account is following, it's following the co-founders and, and I, um, so, you know, you can DM me from there, you can reach out to anybody from there, or you can look up, look me up on LinkedIn. Um, I have different ways I can definitely be reached at, but the main ways I think would be going through our um, Canago app Instagram, or or um, or uh, reaching out to me directly on Instagram at http underscore victor. Uh, yeah, because I know I'll get it for sure if you use any of those channels. Very cool. I'll make sure to uh, include um, you know all those social handles and websites in the description so people can you know click on it and check you out problem thank you yeah so yeah thank you so much victor for being a guest on dear diaspora i really enjoyed learning more about canago and all the things that you're working on and i wish you all the best hey you know thank you for having me it's an honor that you'd even consider me coming on your show so thank you thanks again for tuning in to episode 17 of dear diaspora if you'd like to learn more about Canago, you can visit their website at www.canago.com and the link is in the description. Also, I'd like to hear from you. So if you could take five minutes to fill out the Dear Diaspora survey, 
I would love your input so that we can continue to spotlight the entrepreneurs and innovators really changing the world across the African diaspora. And the link to that survey is also in the description. Thanks for listening to Dear Diaspora. If you like what you hear, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. You can find us on Instagram at Dear Diaspora or visit our website at deardiasporashow.com. Thank you and talk to you next week.